Yeah, All right, think... everyone, so let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is an assistant professor in the School of Information at, at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, Dr. Lee has conducted some of the first studies uh, that empirically examine social implications of algorithms, emerging roles and manage in management and governments in society. Um, today, uh, she will be presenting her paper titled uh, Towards a Participatory Approach for metaverse governance lessons from we build ai which i think is going to be very interesting considering our special focus uh, for the conference so i'll let you go go ahead okay great so um hi everyone my name is ming kyung Lee, uh and it's re really nice to be here it's my first time to be at the image conference so actually i don't know how many of you are from ut austin versus somewhere else actually how many of you are from Austin. Zero. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so okay, so you are from actually flew to the conference. Okay. I hope that the Austin has been treating you okay. <laughs> there has been uh cooling off a little bit. So yeah. Okay. So um when I first was asked to present, I was like, oh, my research is not about image. So what, why are they asking me to present? Because I don't think, yeah, but then I thought about it, this year's conference theme, which is metaverse, virtual representations. And the work that I've been doing uh, for the past three years has, has been thinking about um, if we kind of thinking about the idea that if we can create like virtual decision making models of ourselves, then can we actually use this to uh, enable larger scale um, decision making, potentially uh, deliberation and discussion, etc. So I thought that uh, there is some kind of interesting, uh, unusual maybe, but interesting parallel between the two, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. So, oh, okay. So we build the we build AI is a kind of framework that we propose in our work. So the idea is that people can build a computational model repre representing their uh, individual decision making and then have those models to vote on its individual's behalf. And then we we're interested in this because we thought that this is a one way to enable kind of democratic uh, larger scale decision making online. So to give you one example, I got to uh, go through the step by step. It kind of uh, start with the step where uh, we define kind of what information or feature should be used for decision making. And then we, using those features, we model kind of how each different individual make decisions. And then we aggregate uh, using a voting method. And then we explain those resulting decisions. So this may feel very abstract, so I'm going to explain like, how we're able to kind of apply this framework to a real world context. So we work with a uh, nonprofit organization called For One to Food Rescue, who was, who, um, who that at the time was in Pittsburgh, and this organization is like a giver for donation transportation. So to give an example, the uh, donors, whenever there is an like, incoming donation, they can call this organizations. And the examples of donor can be grocery stores or uh, or like big organizations where they might have a lot of catering food, etc. And then this organization uh, coordinates allocation, meaning calls different potential recipient organizations. And different recipient organizations can be uh, food pantry, shelters for people experiencing homelessness, or lower income, affordable housing, community, et cetera. So they play these matchmaking role. And then once they kind of create the match, they announce this rescue ride uh, using their uh, cell phone. So potential donors can see these uh, donation uh, rescue rides and then they can sign up and volunteer. And uh, they were pretty uh, successful. They had uh, uh, about 1,000 donors, 1,000 recipients, and uh, like, uh, more than 1,000 like, volunteers pool. And they were expanding their model into other cities, including San Francisco, et cetera. So 
the reason why we kind of uh, decided to work with them is that they wanted to introduce a model or a computational way to uh, enable this matching. So at the time, everything was done by a person manually. So they pick up the phone call and then maybe look at the spreadsheet and pick up the re uh, recipient organizations. But it was because it's as a nonprofit, they didn't have a lot of people. So they were really overloaded. And two, um, they wanted to improve equity in this uh, matching process. So for some reason, a lot of the donation distribution was very, very skewed, meaning 20% like of the recipient organization pool received a 70% of incoming donations. And we believe that this was because human was doing it and they don't have time. So they were probably doing it based on the convenience. Like people who have talked recently and maybe they just keep giving it to the same organizations. So they wanted to uh, improve the equity in this donation distribution by introducing some uh, computer systems. And in this kind of matching problem, like balancing equity and efficiency is a key problem. So, and we wanted to have this collective approach, like going back to the framework and having multiple stakeholders make the decision instead of having one person to determine this trade-offs. So kind of balancing the equity and efficiency is a kind of normative uh, decisions, meaning there's no one like right and wrong answers to these questions. And uh, so it can't be done through uh, just pure optimization, for example. So the, uh, and then the other reason why kind of thinking about collective approach was important is that this matching algorithm will have different impacts on different stakeholders involved in the service. So for example, if we prioritize efficiency in uh, delivery, then it's good for volunteer who needs to drive. And also it's good kind of good for the organization who needs to uh, recruit the volunteers because it might be easier to recruit volunteers. But it may mean that it's uh, recipients who are um, leaving further from donation, don the usual donor might likely to get the donation and it can lead to inequity because in, at least in US, a lot of donors were, are located in wealthier areas. But if we prioritize equity, trying to give the donations to recipient in greater needs, then uh, it's, it might be good that the recipient with the greater needs will get it, but also it means the volunteer have to drive longer and then it might be harder for organizations to recruit them. So we wanted to have this model to find a collective solutions uh, to make this trade-off decisions. So we uh, work with uh, four different types of stakeholder, uh, about 25 individuals, including volunteers who transfer donation, recipient organizations, the organization, the matching organization itself and donor donors. So using this framework, we first talk to these stakeholders to understand like what information should be used to make this matching decisions. So we did interviews and we picked the ones that a lot of people mentioned and had a uh, reliable data sources. Like for example, like to determine different clients or recipients needs, a lot of people mentioned that thinking about the poverty level in the area or food access is important. So we consider that. As a measure of uh, efficiency, we looked at the travel distance uh, between donors and then recipients. Uh, and then we also kind of consider some of the temporal dimension, like how many uh, donations they have received, et cetera, so that we can also incorporate that into the matching decisions. Once we uh, determine what information should be used, we, uh, the next time we uh, model like how different individuals would make this matching decisions. And we use two methods iteratively. So the first one, uh, we use a machine learning method, adopting method used in like preference learning. So in this way, in, in this method, we show them a two different recipients, organization who can uh, receive the donations. And then the organization vary in terms of the feature that was derived in the first step. Like, so you see in the slide, the recipient A is a bigger organization, recipient is B is smaller organization. But recipient B is smaller, but you know, uh, less wealthy, poor areas uh, with a shorter distance, etc. And by presenting a series of pairwise comparison, we wanted to know like how people 
balance these factors to pick the right recipients. The clicker doesn't work anymore. Yeah, sorry. Any questions while we we're waiting for the clicker? Yeah, and then to complement the machine learning model, we also use explicit rule model. Here, literally, it was a scoring model, meaning we asked different people to put weight to different decision factors. Uh, so that we can understand like how much emphasis or weight they uh, kind of provide for the different factors. And what's interesting is that overall, machine learning model were uh, pretty <clears throat> accurate, like the blue bar bars here. Um, so it achieved actually more than 80%, 85% accuracy in predicting someone's decision in terms of which recipient they will choose. But interestingly, for someone, uh, for some people, like the ones in the right, uh, the scoring model was actually uh, more uh, accurate than the, the machine learning model. Then once they created this model, we explain, like visualize what kind of rules were learned to the participants so that they can actually choose one of the two models. So the way we uh, describe this um, decision is that for each factor, we showed for different input, like how much weight score it should have. So for example, here, this shows like if it's shorter time, they get higher scores so they should be prioritized. And um, yeah, and then the other one shows like if it's as the poverty rate or, or people, the so poverty rate increases, they should get more priority, et cetera. But this graph will show that they probably prioritize travel time more. Then this is an example of actual participants model. And what we learned interesting is that for some, like the one on the left, the machine learning model, which is blue, and then the explosive model, which is orange, were almost identical, like very, very similar. Whereas the this peop, this person, the, the model looked very, very different. And we talked to this person, and then when they kind of saw this one, this was a employee of the, the volunteer organization, they said, oh, actually I was there when I was had to choose one of the two, which is pairwise comparison, they were focusing on their real world constraint. Uh, whereas they were thinking about asterisk, thinking about like how much, how important is poverty level is or how important food uh, distance is, they were more idealistic. I want to kind of really emphasize the equity. So they put a lot more Wait for, for example, like food access level, poverty level, etc. But at the end, this person chose the rise <coughs> comparison uh, because she couldn't like let go of the real world constraint where she felt that it would be extremely difficult to like, recruit volunteers. So, but this suggests that maybe the way that we elicit people's decision making model may have a big impact on what kind of models are actually being uh, drawn at the end. So once the, each individual chose a model that they thought accurately represent their decision making, we implemented it in the computer system. So in here, in, it means that we had a 25 individual, so we had a 25 decision making model in the system. And whenever there is a new donation, this each of the 25 individual model generated a ranking, like ranked list of potential recipient using their uh, different criteria. And then we, with this like 25 ranked list, we sum the number of votes they got from different stakeholder and uh, um, the uh, rec recipient with a greater, higher score were presented as a top priority. After this, we wanted to explain the resulting decisions for the actual decision maker, which is uh, the like, foreign to food rescue, the nonprofit itself. So we show how different recipient ranked, um, how different recipients were ranked by different stakeholder group, and also the like, overall voting score. This is like a full voting score that they could get, and they got like 
228. And we also show like what factors made the recipient uh, recommend. So, and then we implemented this interface to their system. And I don't think we have a video. And so I'm gonna skip this. Okay. So with this, what did we learn at the end? So one of the big hypotheses they had uh, going into the project was uh, determining what's fair, equitable allocation or matching in this context was really hard. And we wanted to try like having a collective decision making as a one way to address the problem. So thinking about procedural fairness, like fairness in the decision making process, rather than us specifying what is what should be the fair description distribute uh, this outcome distribution or donation distribution in this case. And when we talk to the participating um, individual, our hypothesis was kind of correct in that by having everyone being part of this decision making, it improved the perceived fairness of this matching algorithm. And also we found that people, because they opened it up, this decision-making process to the stakeholders, not just them making the decision, they uh, kind of trusted the governing organization more. But one thing that we are unsure was how this collective decision-making will result in actual outcome distribution, because we are opening up to these participating individuals uh, in terms of what, who should get the uh, donations and how overall collectively aggregate level, like how would that result in uh, kind of outcome distribution? So we ran the simulation using the historic uh, donation, incoming donation data uh, record and compared it with the decisions that actual humans have made in terms of allocating donation versus who might have received donation using this uh, collective models. And you see that the and then here, the orange line is a human, blue line is algorithm, and then the gray line is just random, like meaning like we'll always randomly allocate, match the incoming donations to recipients. And you see that human was really skewed, like um, a few of the recipients were getting, oh, actually, um, a lot of recipients were getting uh, nothing. And then there were a few who were getting a lot. Whereas we saw that when we use the algorithm, it was more evenly distributed compared to humans. <coughs> and then we saw that actually what was happening is that compared to human, uh, algorithm was giving more uh, donations to recipient with a higher poverty rate. Uh, so that was interesting. And we were also worried that by asking people to think about equity, it, it, we were concerned, I was concerned that if what, what happens if it dramatically increased the travel distance, for example. Uh, in this particular case, actually, the distance actually didn't really increase. And uh, aggregate-wise, actually was slightly less than the human, but it didn't have, so it shows that, at least in this case, it didn't increase the uh, travel distance, but it rather just maybe was there, it, they were more successful finding uh, closer organizations, but with you know, who lives in a higher poverty rate. Yeah, and then this is also another um, distance. Uh, yeah, graph. And then finally, what something that we learned also learned something that we didn't anticipate in the beginning. So one thing that we learned is that uh, that we found that. By having this model training process, some people uh, kind of their attitude toward the algorithm and this virtual computational model, uh, their, their attitude became more favorable. So we were very surprised when one of the participants actually approached us at the end of our study, like he was actually very skeptical using computers to make this matching decision. But he said this decision needs a lot of care and love because it's about like picking who needs most and then they decide this uh, hard decisions. But at the end, he saw that this model was able to predict the decision that he would have made really accurately, like about like 90%. And then for the ones that he, that didn't agree with the model was like decision that was hard for him anyway. So 
he at the end he said like now i wholeheartedly believe in the kind of algorithms making these decisions so that was very interesting that this process can have some impact on people's attitude toward the algorithm they also found that the they now understand the difficulties that are involved in such decisions because there's no right and wrong answers and they now emphasize more with the uh, front to rescue who has to make this decision. And this is kind of interesting point because it, it probably uh, increased people's tolerance and understanding of the uh, organization who makes this governing decision when there's no one answer that satisfies everyone to a similar degree. And finally, the other interesting uh, learning was that when we had a uh, three, four, the organizational employee who are actually making these decisions, they all said, I'm following the guideline, internal guideline, et cetera, but their models look quite different in the way that they weighted different factors. So by having them externalize, externalize their decision-making model, we, we were able to also observe like some kind of in, inconsistency in the organization. So that was another uh, an unexpected uh, lesson for us. Okay, so this is a summary. We uh, propose a rebuild AI framework so that they can actually collectively build an algorithm that represents their decision making patterns. And we found that the, this collective participation can lead to AI that better reflect the principles that stakeholder uh, value and find fair. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Does anyone want to start off by asking a question? No, uh, uh, no, please, please, no, you go. <laughs> it's a very sort of like a ignorant question potentially, but I was wondering how big the how big the data sets have to be for equity to yeah. happen. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and there was another uncertainty that we had to deal with because yeah, but what was actually very this is only very interesting to us is that going back to this pairwise comparison we asked them we showed them 50. so they had to like click uh one they these answer these pairwise uh comparisons 50 times and the reason why that was possible is that we it was we leveraged the existing preference model so and then we were unsure how it would work in this case and but it actually well, in, in this case, it led to actually very good accuracy. That's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I uh, um, thank you for your uh, presentation. We have, we've all been tiptoeing around this question of governance and uh, uh, how we can, you know, have a participatory role within this, uh, this abstract thing called the algorithm. And so one of the questions that I have is in your process, were participants or have you considered where participants can continually give feedback on both outcomes and experience where the kind of you know data set and the, the kind of collaborative approach is an ongoing thing that is you know continually being refined looking at the results yeah definitely so it the even though we started with the 25 people because we had to also like design the process as we work with them Initially, the ultimate goal is to have always that when there's a newcomer or a new volunteer, new, new, uh, new or like employees, then they can build their model and contribute to it. So in theory, that's possible. Uh, and then it, it is also possible that we can combine this kind of procedural <coughs> the control with the outcome control. Maybe they can come up with some constraint, meaning, um, I don't know, maybe the travel district, actually they did have a, some kind of constraint, meaning they they said they cannot go longer than 30 minutes. I, I don't remember exactly, but either 30 minutes or one hour because they have to be concerned with the food uh, safety. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it can be combined with the outcome constraint as well. But also, I think we all know that participation is a great way, but also it takes time. <laughs> it takes time from everyone, so that's a to me, that's a challenge that 
Uh, not everyone might be willing to build their model, spending 30 to one hour, right? Uh, for example, and the other known issue, open issue, is that at least using this voting model, meaning majority will win. So that's a known fact about voting. So how do we deal with the, yeah, um, yeah the yeah. error and characteristics of voting? If we tweak it, like what is the right way of tweaking it, et cetera. So that's, yeah. there are a lot of open questions. I have a question. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was great. Um, I, it's always tricky and it, because it opens up a lot of questions about ethics and, and uh, you know, if the human has emotions, right? Like, and it has, you know, but, but ethical values, I guess. And, and the algorithm is more database, a little bit more objective, but these, as far as I understand it, the models are built to kind of around a person, right? Like around the decisions of a person. So in yeah. a way they do contain some of those same kind of ethical yeah. concerns of the person, right? Yeah. So my question is then, you know, you're saying that if there's a new volunteer, you get a new, uh, essentially a new stakeholder in the decision-making process. Um, so is this something that is constantly evolving? Like if someone decides to no longer be a volunteer, does his data stay there? Um, you know, if someone comes with, you know, the wrong intentions, is he going to mess up the, the algorithm? You know, like I'm, I'm wondering like, yeah. what is the control over that? So those are really, really great questions and it's something that we couldn't tackle, like how we actually govern this data and models itself. Um, theoretically, we thought that theoretically, if we think that everyone is rational and individual, then it's actually very hard to game the, game the system because I don't know what decision you will make in theory, but in the real world, I can like ask, 20 recipient organizations in my area and tell them like we should all build this model and put it in there. So um, there are a lot of open issues in terms of how the government should be done. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. We appreciate the talk. It's added a lot to our conversation. <laughs> so we'll take it into the next session with us as well. Thank you all.